In this episode of Getting Geeky with Game Relief, I sit down with Chip and TJ to chat all about the Nomad's Magnetic Dice Tower by Master Monk. It's a great one. Then we'll dive into Kickstarter during our Kickstarter corner portion of the show. But first, a word about our sponsors. This episode of Getting Geeky with Game Relief is proudly powered by the 182 of you who backed our Kickstarter campaign and all of those of you who have been listening to our 350 plus episodes over the years. We couldn't be here without you, so a huge thanks. This episode is proudly powered by Overbattle, the All War. It's a war game you experience and don't just play. It'll be on Kickstarter through Saturday the 20th of April. There will be more said during Kickstarter Corner, but you might as well head on over to overbattle.com to see for yourself. This episode is powered by Gartenbau. It's a tile laying and tableau building on a new level. Want to know more? Go listen to my sit down with one of the designers in the episode entitled... Grow your garden on the tabletop in Gartenbau. Then make sure you back the campaign by Monday the 22nd of April. This episode is powered by Shard Hunters. More to be said during Kickstarter Corner, but I'll just say you've got to see the artwork even if it's the last thing you do. But I hope it's not. It'll be on Kickstarter through... The 10th of May. This episode is also proudly being powered by Solar Flare Games. Robotech Crisis Point game has entered production and can now be pre-ordered. With some extra pre-order limited edition Robotech items as well as exclusives. If you haven't heard it yet, go back and listen to my episode entitled Robotech Crisis Point. To find out more and pre-order it before they run out. This episode is also sponsored by Furious Tree Games LLC. And their latest game creation, Widget Ridge. Which is a steampunk deck building game with crazy inventions that connect to make even cooler inventions. It's an Ian Taylor creation. I had the privilege of having Ian on the show. You can find that on our episode entitled, Can You Tell Me How to Get to Widget Ridge? So, go give it a listen and then back Widget Ridge, which has already surpassed its funding goal by Saturday the 27th of April. Getting Geeky with Gamer Leaf, the podcast in which one man strives to level up his geekhood and helping you do the same one battle at a time. Now, let's get geeky with Gamer Leaf. Welcome to Getting Geeky with Game Relief. Today we have a special treat for you. We're bringing you an interview with the creators and masterminds behind the Nomad's Magnetic Dice Tower Monster Monk that is currently on Kickstarter and over uh, 200% funded. Is that correct? Is that how you guys fall in line with the Nomad's Magnetic Dice Tower, TJ and Chip? Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us on Getting Geeky with Game Relief. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, great being here. Yeah, no problem at all. Now, before we jump into everything that's great about your Dice Tower and what you're doing over there at Monks at Master Monk, let's rewind a little bit if we could. How did you guys, let's if you guys could both introduce yourself and tell me how, or in my audience, how you guys got into playing tabletop board games or role-playing games or however you're involved in the tabletop gaming world. Yeah, so uh, my name's TJ. For me, it was, um, you know, my family would play. We had game night, you know, Risk, Monopoly. Um, and then me and my brother and my best friend growing up, we would always try to make our own board games, you know, back before. It was, you know, a thing, I guess. Um, we never actually made a final product, but, uh, you know, it was just for fun. And we had we had a civilization board game you know it was just when it was raining outside that's what we did you know we didn't really hop on um the playstation or the nintendo or anything like that it was it was board games mostly you know so was there are you what what kind of games are you playing these days oh man now i'd say mostly pathfinder 
um, is the big one for me right now, or Shadowrun. What's Shadowrun? Is that a role playing game as well? Yeah, it's 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 more of a um, dystopian ste- uh, steampunk uh, vibe in the future. So it's pretty cool uh, theme. Uh, it uses all d6s for for the uh, for the rolling and stuff. So a little different than your typical um, role playing game. And then we've we've also got a side game of. Uh, Gloomhaven going as well. Oh, how is that? That's on my shelf of shame or shelf of opportunity. <laughs> you know, it was pretty good. It's different. I don't want to spoil it or anything for you, but if you've got it, I would say find at least two other people and play it because it's it's definitely a good game. Awesome. Yeah, it's a big box for sure. It's a big. It's it's a little intimidating at first. You know, we open it up. We're like, we're never going to get through this. Um, once you get it set up that first time, it's it's actually not as complicated as it might seem. There's just a lot of components, is all. Awesome, yeah, for sure. It looks like it, it looks like it's worth it. Awesome, that's cool. And what about yourself, Chip? How did you get into the world of tabletop board games and role playing games? Uh, from a young age, I was into gaming quite a lot, both digital and board game. Like at the age of five, I got a Super Nintendo for Christmas, and my sister and I played that for years and years. Uh, she eventually got tired of it because I kept beating her at Mario Kart <laughs> and wasn't giving her any leeway. Like it took me a while to grow up and. Realized that it's not all about winning, but I was definitely uh, hard to deal with when I was young. Oh boy, so you're still playing Super Nintendo today too? Oh yeah, sometimes I go back to it. Uh, I'm mostly on PC nowadays, but I do go back to it and play those good old titles. Cool, so did you ever get a Switch with the where they're uploading new games and stuff? Yeah, I'm looking to get a Switch pretty soon, especially for the Smash Brothers. I mean... Uh, my coworker and buddy, he has one, and we've been meaning to play it, but I got a chance to play some of the new Switch uh, Smash Brothers, and it's pretty good. Yeah, we really like it here, um, other than, I, I don't know if I should say this online, I think I have, though. My five-year-old can beat me at it. Oh, <laughs> Is he is he a good button masher? Uh, it's actually a her, but yeah, she, I don't know, she does pretty good. She, it doesn't matter what character she is, neither. Oh, yeah, nice. So yeah, it's pretty good. I, I'm I'm more of the button masher, I think. Uh, I see, but yeah, I love I love that one because it has a lot more um, spatial positioning than most other fighters. So it's it's a neat difference. Uh, also for the board games, uh, I did the whole family night thing, but also in uh, about third grade, I had an incident where uh, I got mauled by a dog, and so I was. Uh, designated to stay in the classroom for the playtime so me and one of my friends just stayed in the classroom and we played board games instead of going out on the field so i just got a big uh, appreciation for that side of gaming as well cool what kind of games did you play there in the classroom in the classroom um they had a pretty good collection it was generally classics like chess and chess uh well chess and checkers uh snakes and ladders uh a lot of those ones because it was third grade so it wasn't like super advanced stuff yet. Um, they had a risk game and several others. I just can't quite remember. But we just started playing regularly after that, even after I healed up. Cool. And what are you playing these days? These days, in terms of uh, tabletop, I need to find a new group. Because I was playing Pathfinder, but uh, everybody kept moving around. So it's just hard to get everybody together. So recently I played One Deck Dungeon, and that's a pretty good one. Uh, it's a good solo RPG. Cool. And so TJ won't let you play with his group? Uh, we're just in <laughs> different locations. I um, mean, he had to drive down quite a ways. Yeah, it's like here. a five-hour drive for me. Otherwise, I'd love, you know, we would definitely all play. Like, when I'm here, you know, I think tonight we're going to do um, oh, Red yeah. Dragon Inn. Yeah, we're going to do um, some Red Dragon Inn. <clears throat> so. Brought some other titles, too. Well, there you go. Awesome. And was there a certain game that got you into the role-playing game or into hobby gaming, Chip? Um, a certain one in, in general no, I mean, like like I said, I started at the age of five with the Super Nintendo, and I've just spent all my money since then. Like, I've been into Magic the Gathering. I've been into, uh, I was in Pokemon cards for a little bit. Not the game, but the collection aspect of it was really appealing, as well as it uh, being kind of uh, multimedia, where I was playing red and blue on my Game Boy, as well as collecting the cards. So it's just the whole kind of package was really interesting to me having digital and 
uh, analog. Cool. Yeah, most definitely. Yeah, we like the all of the digital as well as the analog. And speaking of, like, you talked about you guys both play the role-playing games. Uh, and I guess for any game that includes dice, you guys recently made a dice tower. What can you tell us about the Nomad's Magnetic Dice Tower that's currently on Kickstarter? Yeah, so um, so the, the tower is part of a, of a whole system. Um, so the first Kickstarter was the Nomad's Armory, which is a dice tray uh, that breaks in half or comes apart in half and can either be a box or a dice tray. And when it's a box, you can, you can put a dice box inside of it. And now with this Kickstarter, the dice tower fits in there as well. So it was really the, the whole, the whole picture was a, a compact gaming system that someone could just grab and it's got everything that they need to play a game, you know, and, and it, it works really well with people's limited spaces. Um, the dice tower hooks onto the side of the tray so it's not taking up any more, you know, footprint on the table than it needs to. Um, it can, you know, you can move it around to different parts of the tray uh, for whatever works. Um, and then the whole thing, you know, obviously it breaks down. The pieces magnet to each other um, and fold up to the size of a dice box. So the armory fits either two dice boxes or a dice box and a dice tower, or if you really want, I guess, two dice towers. I really enjoyed the video or whatnot. Yeah, it looks like quite the contraption you guys made. It's it's I, I haven't really done like I guess hours and hours of research, but I think it's you know, the armory itself is the first of its kind on the market in terms of a tray that breaks in half like that and turns into a box in, in that way. So Awesome. Where'd the inspiration for the armory come from? An accident, honestly. Um <laughs> I was uh, I was in the shop designing something similar, but um, it was more along the lines of a deck box actually that started it, and it ended up just evolving into a dice tray because um, it made more sense, you know. So we went from a dice box that split in half, and we were like, "Eh, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense because the cards can fall in between that slot, you know, or get stuck in it, and it had its own issues there." But it really made a lot of sense as a dice tray. And then we brought on uh, this. Is, that's that's at that point we brought on Chip and Wolf on our during. It was during our first Kickstarter, and you know they were able to help us. You know, we, we it started off. It only held like a dice box. They were able to you know come on the team and say, hey, what if we made this a little bit bigger, fit two things in there, and we come out with a second Kickstarter. You know, after this one that lets us do a dice tower. And at the time, I was like, I don't even know if we'll be able to make a dice tower fit in this thing. It's so small. Um, but we did, you know, <laughs> Wolf's over here rubbing his, you know, he's polishing his own little pin, but yeah, no, he's, uh, <clears throat> we got a good team here. It's, uh, we all work really well together, um, bring our heads together and, you know, either design or redesign some things that are already on the market and make them into something that's unique for us, you know? Yeah, most definitely. And it looks like there's quite a few different designs you can choose. Are those like laser engraved, the different, um, pictures that are on the boxes oh yeah the inlays those are pretty nice yeah those are yeah so those are our inlay options um currently actually the only tower that i've fully finished with an inlay is that dragon um obviously we've already done all the inlays on dice boxes um just timing for this has been uh has been hard um in terms of you know finding the time to sit down and do the inlays because those take a lot of time and, you know, if I do it, I want to make sure it's done right, not rushed. Um, so I was finally able to get that, that Bay Dragon Dice Tower, as it's called, um, done up. And it turned out really nice. Um, we got some sand shading in on the logo there. And uh, there's, there's a dragon on both sides. So it's not just one dragon on one side of the tower. There's one on each side. Um, and that's, that's honestly a lot of people really like our inlay work. Um, anytime we go to a convention or... You know, people get our stuff. They're like, wow, the inlay is just that's the best they've ever seen. You know, um, we get all kinds of compliments for it. So, yeah, awesome. So what is an inlay exactly? Is it like laser engraved or like painted on or what is the inlay exactly? So we, we cut out the pieces on the laser, um, mostly because you can get way more accurate on a laser machine than you can by hand. Um, and then from there, the whole thing is, is done by hand. So the pieces fit together and then it's, it's glued to the to the wood substrate. Um, and the inlay pieces are solid wood. Yeah, everything's solid wood. 
uh, the, there's no paints, there's no dyes. It's that's the color of the wood. Um, and then it's you know from there it's sanded down and polished up. And sometimes we'll put like a a thicker border around certain inlays. Um, I know there's a picture on our Instagram account floating around. Someone wanted a monogram uh, and laid onto a dice tray of ours, and uh, it turned out pretty beautiful. Um, and that's got some really, really heavy uh, relief um, outlining to it. So yeah, it looks. Uh, yeah, I really like the inlays as well as the whole system or not. So um, with the dice tower, so. Um it's it's like there's a couple pieces of wood if I understand correctly and then you get magnets to get magnets together and then you have a dice a dice tower yeah that's correct uh, it uses rare earth magnets so they're strong magnets that'll hold up when you're putting like just tons of dice through the tower itself so all the shelves don't budge the tower folds up to the size of one of our dice boxes and it fits inside of the nomad's armory which is the tray when it's all folded up Awesome. Now, somebody hasn't taken a chance. They don't have the armory. They're new to the whole system or whatnot. Is there a way for them to get the armory as well as the dice tower? Or what can they get if they take a chance on this Kickstarter? Yep. They can get the full armory or they can get just the dice tower itself. It can work as a standalone, but it really shines like when it's all together as a full system because it's so modular. And that's what I'm probably most proud of with this whole system is this modularity. Like each piece can function alone. But together, it's just super, super functional, almost like the Swiss Army, like a Swiss Army knife of tabletop. Oh, there you go. I like that. The Swiss Army of tabletop. That's pretty cool. And it looks like that you guys do pins as well. Like I guess if somebody's doing a role playing game, or I guess really lately in the tabletop board game space, roll and rights have been pretty uh, taken off quite a bit here. So you have pins as well? Yeah, we started doing pins for the conventions, actually, um, and people love them. Yeah, it started out as a, a giveaway, and we're, we're thinking about taking it more to market as an actual product we offer. Uh, they're, they're pretty cool looking. I like them a lot. Yeah, I'm looking at the Kickstarter page, and yeah, they look pretty cool, and they, they write okay as well? Yeah, they, they write really nicely. Well, that's good to hear. Yeah, and just looking, at, just uh, yeah, I've been scrolling back and forth through your Kickstarter page. Just everything, at least to me, looks amazing, and it sounds like a quite the system you have with the dice tower, and you can set it there, um, right inside the dice box, so you can roll, and then it all collapses, really nice. And uh, when you with your previous Kickstarter, did you have a lot of people coming over to the new one so they can get the dice tower as well, or what kind of? Yes. <laughs> Um, yeah, we had a lot of people from the original Kickstarter come on to this one. That's kind of, we have a wave on there. It's it's the Dice Tower only wave, I guess. And that was mostly designed for those backers that, you know, they didn't need the full system. They just needed the Dice Tower. Um, that way they could get in there. And it, that helps us break down our manufacturing. Um, if all they need is one Dice Tower, we can, we can you know, figure out then how to, how to time our manufacturing. Because something that hurt us on the last, on the first Kickstarter that we weren't expecting was the average full armory that was ordered ended up being 2.3. Um, so each backer was ordering over two of something, um, which is awesome, but we weren't expecting that. You know, we're like, oh, people go in there, they'll buy their one armory and that'll be it, you know? So we opened up the tiers and uh, set it to that, you know, if one person buys one armory, this is what we can handle in a month or whatever. Um, and it, you know, more than a little more than doubled what we expected. And so, it was a bit of a scramble to try to get, you know, things done and done right on time. And we were a little bit behind, but, you know, now it's, I think there's one order that was like a super special order that needed to go out um, that we're, you know, we're working with. But, um, you know, everyone's really happy with their stuff. Um, so, you know, obviously they're coming back and they're pretty excited about the tower. A lot of them got to see it at PAX uh, South or PAX Unplugged this year. Um so yeah, we're, we're, we're pretty stoked. Yeah, it's, we are. It's good to have those, you know, those repeat um, fans that come back and especially when you get to talk to them, you know, you get to know who they are as people. Um, yeah, we really appreciate our backers and we try and support them as best we can. I mean, that's what uh, originally we were planning on this current Kickstarter to be launching about February, but we pushed it back because we were trying to make sure we finished and had a great handle on our past Kickstarter before we started a new one. Like we don't want to 
put off what our promises were to our previous Kickstarter. Like, we don't want to put off all those promises and start something new before we, like, just complete it. Yeah. No, that's really good to hear. And you talked about the waves. Um, so it looks like everybody's not going to get there at the same time. What can you tell us about the whole wave system? So it's it's broken down into three different categories. Um, if, you, if you skip that very first one, um, that's a dollar. Um, so the $33 wave is, is for anyone that needs either one of something or or if they actually need the full system. That, that's kind of where you want to go and pledge. Um, so, you know, $33 is the starting cost of what would be an Ash dice box, for example. And then if you want to add the dice tray to that, you you know, we have a, we have a pledge calculator. Um, the very first image in the Kickstarter, actually, if you click on that, it takes you to a pledge calculator so you can, you know, everything gets figured out for you cost-wise. Um, you, you know, you just add the items from there. What does it, you know, you add your dice tower on top of that, your dice tray, your Nomad's lid, if you want a, a nicer lid versus just your standard lid. Um, if you want a different wood type, you know. And then the there's that, <clears throat> the second tier would be that, uh, the tower only tier that I had mentioned, where if all you're looking for is a single tower, right? And again, that was more for our original backers, but if, you know, anyone, if they're just looking for just a tower, you go on there and you pledge for just a tower. Um, and then the final one is for inlays. Um, anything, if you want anything inlaid, we try to get people to go under that tier because the inlay work takes a lot of time. And so we have to space that out over a longer period so that we're not hurting ourselves manufacturing wise. Cause that was another thing that slowed us down on the, on the last one. Um, that we want to make sure that we're getting right this time um, so that people can get things on time. Okay, and so each wave, they have a different delivery date, is that right? Correct, yeah. And so wave one uh, will be, gosh, what did we set? Wave one, July, I believe. I don't even remember. <laughs> uh, wave one, I believe, is July, and then it goes out uh, It goes out one month for each wave. So each each wave equals one month of deliveries. That's pretty cool. Awesome. So you make sure everybody gets their stuff in time and you're not killing yourselves. And you do this all in a, a shop of your own or a wood shop or something? Yeah, we actually have three shops because um, we're all over the place. Uh, we don't. Our main shop is in Kentucky. So everything ships out of Kentucky. Um, all the really fancy equipment is there. Um, our CNC machines, laser machines, um, cabinet making equipment, you know, you name it. And then uh, our lathe turner, Wolf, he's... Uh, He's here in LA with Chip, and they do all of the pen turning, uh, things of that nature. And then on my end, I mostly, I mean, I mostly do the uh, prototyping for a lot of stuff, and I help out with like the trays themselves. Awesome. Speaking of prototyping, uh, can, I know we're right now we're focused on getting the Nomads Magnetic Dice Tower funded and delivered and everything, but what can you share any inside secret information on what you might be coming with to us within the future? All the secrets? Um, Honestly, like, what we were talking about in preparation for this interview, and one thing that we're going to be talking about later this week is our Nomads lid, and that can hold pens or dry erase markers or wet erase or extra dice, and we're actually planning to make that lid a little bit bigger to better hold dice like full sets instead of just like currently it only has space for like d6s and d10s, d10s yeah. and like d percentiles but we're looking to make it a little bit bigger so it can fit like d4s even d12s and d20s and, and then uh, uh, fancier way nicer pens that uh wolf has been making that yeah. don't quite fit in there but they're going to. So. Yeah, they're going to. We're going to make it work. <laughs> they're, they're, they're really nice pens. Um, just like the last Kickstarter, any design things that we're coming out with, the prices are going to stay the same, and the backers are going to get that new value. Yeah. So they pay for it, and we redesign it. We make it better. They and stay at their same price, and they get the new stuff. And after the Kickstarter is when we raise prices to match what we need to do. Yeah, like on the first Kickstarter, the size started half of what it is. We changed the size to double that. It cost us quite a bit in uh, not really a, a whole heap of a lot in manufacturing because it was still the same process, but the wood cost went up. But, you know, we didn't ask backers for any more money, you know, or anything like that. It was just, you know, this is the new design. This is what you guys are getting. And then prices had to go up, obviously, after that. But, you know, yeah. we're not... We don't. When we go to Kickstarter, it's not a finished product. We're not saying, "Oh, give us money on Kickstarter." It's here's this design. If you guys have ideas, and you know you want to see something change, 
hit us up, you know. Um, that's kind of what happened with the first one. Yeah. A lot of people came back, gave us ideas, and we actually, it evolved through the Kickstarter. That's so. our philosophy with Kickstarter is that people are coming to us, and they're taking the chance on our company. And so we really want to pay that back to them. Yeah. That's good to hear. Yeah, let them be involved. So that's awesome. Now, if somebody goes ahead and they back it, will shipping be charged now or or later on? So we're doing that later on um, because shipping is a nightmare, unfortunately. Um, and it always is. It's always changing. Um, and usually not for the better. It's, you know, prices keep going up. Yeah, the nightmare part of it is promising certain prices or certain um, yeah. delivery dates and all that stuff beforehand. So we're going to be handling the shipping prices on CrowdOx after this Kickstarter finishes its run. So we'll charge uh, the shipping prices then because we'll know for sure like what prices are going to be, especially international prices. They fluctuate and different countries have different politics going on, all that kind of thing. Yeah, and that was another thing too. Like Since the size changed on the first Kickstarter, the weight changed. And that wasn't a huge deal inside the United States, but for international backers, the cost went up like $15 for shipping, and we had charged that before. So we were eating the cost of having to ship things overseas because of that extra weight in the tray. So one, we don't want to kind of, you know, we don't want to hurt ourselves by not charging enough if things do happen to change weight-wise, you know, after afterwards a little bit. And Two, it lets us be as fair as possible with those prices afterwards. So No, that's really good. Yeah, I've heard that um, shipping can eat creators alive, especially like with the different games and stuff, doing stretch goals, and then they change the box to diameter just slightly, and it goes up to the next bracket and so on and so forth. Yeah, and that can, I mean, it's in the past, I know it's bankrupted um, some some board game makers, just the shipping, you know. Yeah having I mean, that wrong so it's 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 important to make sure that we get it right and the easiest way to do that is just to do it after yep and we'll work with backers quite a lot trying to make everything fit in certain dimensions like if they order several uh sets we'll make it fit in like one one delivery so it's not multiple customs that we're paying or charging there you go that's pretty good now when it comes to the nomads magnetic dice tower um somebody hasn't checked out the last one or they're new and they want to come on board, what makes the Dice Tower pop as something my audience should go check out if they like what they've heard and whatnot? And then if they like what they see on the Kickstarter and everything, why should they back it? So I think what really pops with this whole system is managing your dice coming into the game, both on the table itself and in your carrying and storage. This whole system folds up into the armory. The tray folds up and it becomes a closed box with a lid so it doesn't come apart in your backpack and it's held together with rare earth magnets so it's like very solid in your backpack and a very nice uh, profile and then when it opens up it keeps your dice managed in a certain area on the table so it's not uh, you're not rolling all over the place everything's done in very high quality solid wood the finishings in uh, tongue oil right now and we have like camfered edges. Everything's just very aesthetic and nice looking on the table. Yeah, I, I come from a long line of uh, woodworkers in my family. I've been doing it, I mean, since I was a kid. Uh, Wolf, uh, same thing, you know, my father. It's Woodworking's always been in our family. Um, it's something that, you know, if we're going to do it, we're going to want to make sure it's done right. So when you when you when you look at our products and you get our products in your hand, it's not just you know something that someone built in their garage, um, or you know as a fun side hobby. Um, this is something that we take very seriously, and there's a lot of information on the market about woodworking that's not accurate, and we're trying to set the record straight on the right way to do woodworking in a lot of aspects. Um, and we we definitely stand behind our work too. You know, we, there's always going to be cases where you get, a, you get a piece of wood with a hairline crack in it that you just can't see and you drop it just a little bit and it'll break, you know, and that's just the wood itself. And we always replace those items, you know. No, that's good to hear. That's awesome. Now, what are some of the things that are wrong in the wood um, in the woodworking business or whatnot or the industry that you've noticed? One that drives me nuts is plywood. Um, 
I don't, I'm not going to go into that a whole heap of a lot. It's, it's got its uses, but, um, I'm not a huge fan of it. Um, if you're, if you're making something that you want to last a long time, it, I don't think there should be plywood being used. Um, it doesn't do well under, um, under moisture conditions, you know, like a, like a solid piece of wood can. Um, but you know, that's, that's a, that's a personal taste. Um, it's got a lot of, you know, harsh chemicals in it and stuff. It's, it's just not my thing. Um, all, a lot of the finishing, the way that, that, uh, the online industry tells you how to finish a product or take care of a wooden product is, um, actually detrimental to the wood. I know for years, uh, shelves were selling citrus oil as a cleaner for wood. And actually all that does is breaks down the actual finish and dries out the wood in the long run. Um, so, you know, there's just, there's some things like that out there that we're trying to, and it, we're not the only ones, you know, that are trying to set the record straight on some of this stuff, but, um, there definitely is some misinformation out there that has gotten to the public that is unfortunate. So, yeah, with our, marketing, we try to be as honest as we can. Yeah and make sure that we're giving our customers and backers like the best of our information. We're not trying to sell them anything that doesn't work. We're not trying to be snake oil salesmen like that, but there is some of those kind of marketers in the industry, unfortunately, and we just have to start sending out good information. No, that's that, that's great. And you talked about having preferences in wood. Everybody has their own preferences, and it looks like if people come on the Kickstarter, they can actually choose different kinds of wood to have their their dice tower and nomad box created out of. Is that right? That is correct. Yeah, there's a whole heap of a lot of different woods, um, and you know, it, it, some of it comes down to aesthetics. You know, what do you like the look of? And another question, though, that's almost more important is what type of dice are you rolling? We have a lot of people that are coming to us and they're saying, hey, I roll metal dice. Are these going to be fine? And the answer is yes and no. It depends on the wood type. Um, some woods are softer than others. You know, so if, if you want to roll metal dice, don't buy walnut. Don't buy um, cedar. Yeah, don't, definitely don't buy cedar. Um, it's, you know, you're just going to dent the wood up. Um, like, if you get something like a wenge, you know, it's a harder wood type. And, that, you know, if, if they have a question, they're like, hey, I want to roll metal dice. What wood type should I go with you know we'll let them know um which ones work and which ones don't yeah i mean some people like the the character that starts building up over usage yeah um there's some of our audience are big fans of that some of our audience doesn't like that some like their stuff to always look pristine other ones want it to have that kind of memory embedded into the like wood itself <laughs> well there you go yeah that's good to hear because i um a while back ago i worked with somebody who um, their dice were called table breakers because yeah, they were pretty hefty or whatnot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That that is some of the marketing that I see for the metal dice. They're like, yeah, this will wreck your tables, and people are just like really excited about it. How much like how savage the dice can get. Yeah, most definitely. And it sounds like um, this something like this might be helpful for people with kids or whatnot as well because we have um. My wife, my daughter, my five-year-old daughter made me, well, she didn't make me, but she had me sit down to play Monopoly with her for a while, and I had to keep on saying, roll them right here so they don't go flying all over the room. So something like that, if you have kids, it looks like the dice tower would be perfect as well. Oh, yeah. Well, and the nice thing, too, about the whole system is most kids are not strong enough to actually open that lid off um, of the armory. It's, it's four magnets that have a 9.8-pound pull force, I believe. So you have eight magnets all pulling at each other with a lot of force. Yeah. Um, and you know, we obviously we did that to keep things in there, but it does it, it keeps kids out of that system. And if you drop that as a as a box, you might you know you might ding it, you might dent it, but it's going to be fine. Um, and that that's what you know that's important because yeah, we did a bunch of testing with these boxes, dropping it from like six foot heights, <laughs> like eight foot heights. Well, yeah, we we had the fun Wolf's time. Wolf's in that. the background saying like way more, like he threw it on like concrete flooring. He dropped one off a cliff. Yeah, there was a two hundred foot. <laughs> rock face that he threw it down. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it fell off a cliff. <laughs> So we, we're just trying to do a lot of different play testing on these. Well, yeah, that sounds pretty cool. The, the awesome that they were able to hold up to that and that you were able to play test or whatnot. So, yeah, if anybody's listening right now, make sure you go ahead and jump on over and check out the Kickstarter that's currently going for the Nomad's Magnetic Dice Tower by Master Monk. That'll be on Kickstarter through 
the 4th of May. Now, we don't want to keep you guys all day, so mind us coming there to your hometowns to stalk you. How would people go about keeping up with what you have going on over there at Mas- Master Monk? Um, any social media outlets always good. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Yeah, I mean, um, sign up for our email list. That's yeah. probably the best route. Yeah, email list is always going to be the best route. Um, if you go to our website, mastermonkgaming.com, uh, there's a there's a link there to sign up for that email list. And, you know, I'd say, I mean, during a Kickstarter, we might send out a little, you know, emails a little more often. But right now we're looking to send out two emails a month, you know, just to kind of keep people informed of things that are coming out, um, what's going on. Yeah, we're not trying to be spammy, but we want it yeah. to be good information. Yep. Awesome. Yeah, most definitely. So, and you get those links to me, I'll make sure I include them in the show notes so people can just click on over. But yeah, like I said, we don't want to keep you all day, but we really appreciate you coming on Getting Geeky with Game Relief with us to talk all about the Nomad's armory system as well as the magnetic dice tower that's there on Kickstarter right now. Well, thank you. I appreciate you having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem at all. Wow, that was quite exciting. I think just about everyone needs one of these dice towers. So run on over and back their project. Let them know Game Relief sent ya. Now, shall we see a very small portion of what's on Kickstarter? What is this place? What is it doing here? In the Leaves computer. Oh, it's Kickstarter Corner with the Leaves. Now you've all played a game. That's just fun and dandy. But an experience would be even better, wouldn't you say? Well, I've got the game for you then. It's Overbattle the All War. I've had many a conversation with Rob, the mastermind of this game. He's been tirelessly going from con to con all over the country, allowing others to join in on the experience. During our interview, he convinced me that I want to experience Overbattle. It's not a typical war game where it takes eons and eons to set it up. But you play right out of the box. It's huge and I want it. But we can't make this a possibility until we get over the mindset that a first time creator can't make a huge game with a funding goal over 50000 or at a buy in of over $100. What would have happened had we done that to Cool Mini or Not or Simon or any of these others? Do me a favor, go check out the page and see what you think. If you're following the campaign, back it. If we all wait on the sidelines, waiting to see if it gets to its funding goal, it may not make it. So, go back over battle and make it a reality. If you're in the Arizona area, PM me so we can get together with Rob and actually experience it with him. If you'll be at PAX East this weekend, go try it out. Tell him Game Relief sent you. Pretty much what I'm saying is, don't wait. Back over battle today. Have you ever wanted to be a great tinkerer? One who fiddles with the oddities and curiosities of the strangest parts of the Wild West? Well, of course you have! Don't be ridiculous! In the new card game, Area 1851 Express, from 524 Labs, the creators of Minworks, now you can! Ooh, here's a lively game in session now. Let's watch. Ooh, I got a feeling I'm gonna be the best gadget today! Ha! <laughs> he won't be the best. He's <laughs> just some wolf. Well, you're just plain. Plain? Well, I'll show you. So, what have you got, Mr. Tough Mod? Ha <laughs> ha! I'm a plain old bitch for. What do you got, little woolly? How's a freaking spacesuit treat you? Oh no, he didn't. Ooh, yeah, he did. Well, at least I ain't that guy. Well, that was uncalled for. If you're an aspiring, fun-loving tinker that's looking to create the greatest gadget in the weird and wild west, then Area 1851 Express is for you. So go grab some friends, a handful of cards, and play Area 1851 Express, new from 524 Labs. What on earth was that? Or is it even from Earth? Aliens have landed in the wild west and are trading technology with the locals. Combining card drafting and set collection, you'll create out-of-this-world gadgets with hilarious modifications sure to keep everyone laughing. Wow, does this sound like a game I want. 
It's Area 1851 Express. Area 1851 Express is a 2 to 5 player card drafting and set collection game that plays in about 30 to 45 minutes. Back it on Kickstarter before Friday the 19th of April. And if the cards are aligned right, we'll get the people of 524 Labs on the show to tell us more nearer the end of their campaign. So look out for that. We teased a bit about this at the first of the show, but Shard Hunters the Card Game is on Kickstarter. It's got it all with simple and dynamic gameplay, exclusive artwork, do you love dark fantasy card games but don't have much time? This 20 minute game is for you. Go check out the Kickstarter page and if you like what you see, make sure you're back it before the 10th of May. After a short hiatus, a note for murder is back on Kickstarter. Set in the world of Sherlock Holmes, deduce the criminal, their weapon, and the planned location of the murder before it goes down. In case you missed it, I sat down with Michael, the publisher, to talk all about it. That can be easily accessed in my episode entitled, What If You Got a Note for Murder? Go give it a listen, check out their Kickstarter campaign, and then back a note for murder before Thursday the 2nd of May. Now it's come to our least favorite time of the day, and yours too. Time for me to get on with my life, and y'all to get on with yours. But in the meantime, until Saturday when I have robbed the mastermind of Overbattle the All War on again, go ahead and get geeky, stay geeky, and bring others into Geekfold by sharing this episode with them. Game Relief out. <laughs> Gamer Leaf levels up. Tune in next week to see if Gamer Leaf's luck holds up. <laughs> <laughs>